68 degrees. Has been with us here numbers of times at Brown Trail, both in our lecture program as well as, I believe, the last three years. He's been with us here at Brown Trail during our family enrichment week in which we have the family of of uh, the Lord here at Brown Trail, composed then of all the families themselves, individual units. We come together and uh, have classes for the young ones and then a class for the young people and the adults all together. Brother Ramsey has taught us in the Minor Prophets. He's taught us on one year in Isaiah and Jeremiah, another year in Ezekiel and Daniel. And we always enjoy having him to come and to be with us. Johnny is now conducting meetings throughout the year. Oh, many meetings throughout the year. I believe last year, we have 40 some odd meetings. Any way you want to look at that, that is a lot of gospel meetings in one year. Not but 52 weeks in a year. If you can't think about that many meetings in a year, you've got a lot of time given to the Lord in that particular thrust. In addition to that, he is now preaching weekly over the power of a 50,000-watt station, KRLD, on Sunday nights at 10.30. You'll want to get a hold of that program and listen to it. Aired every Sunday night at 10.30 and is under the caption of Landmarks for Living. Landmarks for Living. Over 50,000-watt station, KRLD. That's not the first time he's been on that power of the station. He was on it for a number of years back not too many years ago, and so he's back on that station as of now. Then, as you also know, for the last several issues, how many, John, half a year now? About nearly a year. About nearly a year, he's edited the Christian Bible Teacher. And incidentally, we're glad to have Brother Whitehead. Where are you, Benny? Stand up. That is the owner of the Christian Bible Teacher, so right back here. We're delighted to have you here, Benny. And Johnny edits the paper. And uh, there are numbers of copies of these over in their display area, which is back, I believe, in this area of the facility. And go by that particular booth and pick up a free copy of this current issue, The Christian Bible Teacher, January 1982. And so it's worth a dollar and fifty cents, but you can get a free copy. That's right, it's a dollar and fifty cents. It's a 44 page periodical. Beautifully done. And uh, there'll be a place there for you, I'm sure. I haven't seen it, but I know that there'll be a place there for you to subscribe to this periodical. And do that. Do that. And have this to come into your home monthly. Have a half a dozen or a dozen of these periodicals coming into home and read all of them. Profit greatly as a result of them. Let's be reading people. Reading people. What advantage does a person who never reads have over a person who can't read? And so we really need to be students, and these are simply tools that we can employ. So it's a delight indeed to have Johnny with us, and today to speak to us on the difficult text of the book of Genesis. Brother Ramsey. When he said that I preached weekly on the strong station, I wondered about that introduction. There have been those who said that they knew why I was selected to speak on where Satan came from because no one was more familiar with the devil than I was. <laughs> one of the elders here said there was one that was more familiar, but he was busy introducing me today. <clears throat> Let me say before I begin the discussion of Satan's origin, where the devil came from. That I differ on this from most people, and that isn't important. It's important we all study the Bible. And our conclusions about the devil's power and his work and our opposition to him certainly will not be changed. But I'm saying this for a purpose. The best lesson I ever heard on the idea that the devil is a fallen angel was presented by Wayne Jackson at the uh, lectureship in Knoxville about four years ago, and in a book that Brother John Waddy has edited in their annual series at the School of Preaching there in Knoxville uh, called Great Doctrines of the Bible, Wayne has a brilliant lesson uh, that's the best I've ever heard, and I heard it in person and have read it too, uh, on the subject. So you might want to, in other words, I'm selling some books for John today, uh, but it is a great book anyway, and that's an outstanding lesson. 
Now let's get to the major point, and that's the devil's power and how we need to beware of it. And then I will discuss passages that are often cited for the assumption or the teaching that the devil is a fallen angel and show why I do not believe those passages teach it. And then this will encourage us all to study our Bibles more. In other words, we should be concerned with the devil's destiny more than his origin anyway. If we know what he is about and what his work is and where he would lead men, we must avoid that, and the Bible equips us fully to do it. Knowing where he came from could not possibly help us any more in our fight against him if we understand his destiny and where he's trying to lead us. Now, here are some passages that are very important, and most of them very well known. 1 Peter 5, 89, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist ye steadfast in your faith. In James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Luke 22, 31, Jesus said, Satan desires to have you. In Ephesians 6, 11, we read of the wiles of the devil. And he is a crafty chameleon, able to change his spots and stripes to meet the environment and to meet our weaknesses, and with his ploys to lead us to perdition. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says we're not ignorant of his devices, lest Satan gain the advantage over us. Ephesians 4.27 says don't give place to the devil. And one modern speech translation says don't give the devil a launching pad in your life. And that really is the thrust of that. 1 Timothy 3.7 mentions the snare of the devil, which many people believe means that he was snared by pride, and that's the most difficult area in our lives. But at any rate, we learn that the devil desires to catch us in his snare. The two most definitive passages I've ever read concerning the devil and his awesome work, Revelation 12, 11 and Revelation 20, verse 2, where he is identified as that old serpent, Satan, the devil, the deceiver of the whole world. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says he is the prince of this world. Ephesians 6, 10 to 12 speaks of spiritual wickedness in high places, and we know that the devil is the author of that. 2 Corinthians 11, 3 says, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, even so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And later in that same 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians, we learn that the devil and his servants are transformed into angels of light, and yet their work is of a counterfeit nature. The word uh, translated Satan in the New Testament is our word adversary, and the devil is an active adversary. The word for devil is diabolos, and he is a diabolical demon. He's identified as the strong man whose house the Lord was able to spoil, Mark 3:27. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Christians are told uh, to take heed lest they fall. And just a few verses earlier in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, the great apostle Paul, used by the Lord to write one half of the New Testament, said that he himself could become a castaway. And certainly it's because of the devil's work that anyone could become a castaway. Interesting verses are 1 Thessalonians 2, 18, where Paul told the brethren in Thessalonica, I would have come unto you once and again, but Satan hindered us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in identifying his thorn in the flesh, he referred to it as a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Perhaps the most interesting two chapters in the Bible concerning the devil's tenacious bulldogish work would be Job chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 4, where he boldly comes into the presence of God Almighty and later face to face with Jesus Christ, tempting him through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the vain glory of life, 1 John chapter 2, with which or by which Christ was able to withstand him because of his contact with the Lord and the Lord's word saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. Jude chapter 9 mentions uh, the devil arguing with uh, Michael concerning the body of Moses. And in Zechariah chapter 3, we probably have the outstanding Old Testament reference back of Jude verse 9. All of this tells us that the devil is very shrewd, very powerful, very bold, not the least bit bashful, and thus it is his work that should consume our great concern. We understand he is the enemy of our spiritual being. But where did he come from? 
For years and years, I personally believe, through studying everything that I've been able to read that brethren have written and others have, and all the commentary references, I've come to the conclusion that most people have been influenced by Milton's Paradise Lost more than by the Bible when they immediately say the devil must be a fallen angel. Now, he may be a fallen angel, but I do not believe the Bible teaches that. I believe that that is as good a guess as any, an assumption, but I do not believe the passages often cited by our brethren and by others prove that he is a fallen angel. For instance, Lucifer in Isaiah chapters 13 and 14. Lucifer has become a synonym for the devil, a nickname for him, as though that were his personal name. And yet if you read Isaiah chapters 13 and 14, he is not referring to the devil there, but to Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. All you have to do is read those two chapters to see that to be true. In fact, the word is translated day star. The point he's making in Isaiah 13 and 14, as he does in other prophetical literature, is that a kingdom and a ruler that seemed to be so strong, who would stand forever, who would never be swayed, whose government would never come to naught, is likened unto the sun, the moon, the stars that suddenly fall. And as the day star shines brightly and then is gone, so Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon were. And that's the context of Isaiah 13 and 14. And for people who are schooled in telling their neighbors and friends to study the context of whom was he speaking, to whom was he speaking, what was the result, what was the background, what is the nature of the context and of the whole book, we're really hard-pressed to prove we believe that when we say Lucifer of Isaiah 13 and 14 is the devil, when it's very clear to anyone who will read that he's referring to Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. The same thing is true of the famous statement in Luke 10, 18. I beheld Satan falling as lightning falls from heaven. When you read that context, he's not talking about the origin of the devil. That's in the first century. The devil has been in existence a long, long time before that. Jesus is not speaking of where the devil came from. In fact, in the context, he has sent his servants out on the limb to commission, has empowered them with great ability. And as a result of their work, Jesus said, I beheld Satan falling as lightning falls from heaven. How does lightning fall from heaven? Suddenly, sharply, clearly. And that's the way the devil's power waned as they went about doing God's will. Some say, but how about the context of Revelation 12? And that's the proof text for many, many people. And yet our approach to Revelation 12 and using that as the origin of the devil gets us in trouble when we try to explain the rest of the book in harmony with its setting. Again, Revelation 12, I don't know of anyone that disagrees that the book of Revelation was written within the last 40 years of the first century. I know some believe prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, some in the last decade of the first century, either Nero's day or Domitian's day, but everybody believes it was written in the last 40 years of the first century. The devil had been in existence for centuries and centuries and centuries when Revelation 12 was written. And incidentally, John wrote what he saw in this apocalypse, this revelation, this unveiling. That's where you get the name Revelation. He was told to write what you see. This was a drama enacted before his eyes that illustrated spiritual truths and principles. And he wrote what he saw at the end of the first century. He's not talking about where the devil came from there. So we need to put it back in its setting. Some say, uh, how about uh, Ezekiel 28? Now that has to be where the devil came from. He has to be talking about the devil there because he talks about the Garden of Eden and things that just could not apply to anyone but the devil. We have another problem, brethren. We say study the context. To whom is a thing written? What's the background? As I turn to Ezekiel 28, he's talking to the king of Tyre, not to the devil, or about the devil. Study the Bible in context. But how can you explain some of those passages in Ezekiel 28 that identify with the Garden of Eden? I guess the same way we explain John chapter 8, where Jesus said to the Jewish religious leaders of his day, when they claim Abraham is their father, he said, Abraham is not your father. Your father is the devil, and he was a murderer from the beginning. He takes them all the way back to the Garden of Eden, too, though they live centuries later. The point he's making is you identify with that treacherous one who walked in 
the garden who did so much evil there. He is your spiritual father. I suppose we could explain Ezekiel 28 like we have explained 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. How could Noah, centuries before Jesus lived, preach in the spirit of Christ while the ark was preparing? And yet we've never had any problem making that application. I, I don't know hardly anybody that doesn't say that the preaching that was done in 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19 was done by Noah in the spirit of Christ while the ark was preparing. I believe in Ezekiel 28, he speaks to the king of Tyre and says, you act in such a way, such an ungodly, hellish way, you identify with the events in the Garden of Eden that started this problem of sin that entered the world and death by sin. Romans 5 verse 12. Again, the passages that we have cited through the years, many times I believe we have borrowed from the Seventh-day Adventist and Milton's Paradise Lost instead of the Bible itself. The conclusion I would make is we don't know where the devil came from, and it doesn't make a bit of difference. Where he came from is not the least bit important. It's what he's doing and where he's going that we ought to be concerned about. In Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, our Lord said that he will say in the final day of judgment, Depart from me. Where will they go? To be with the devil and his angels. There's his destiny, and I don't want to go there. The greatest thing, though, that I learned in studying the Bible about God and the devil and the great battle between heaven and hell, right and wrong, truth and error, Jehovah and Satan, is that Christ is more powerful than the devil. 1 John 3, 8 says, For this cause was the Son of God made known, that he might bring to naught the power of the devil. 1 John 4, 4 says, He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. 1 John 5, 4, <laughs> written the Christian, says this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Some have made the following suggestion. I remember reading it several years ago. If the devil is a fallen angel, if he fell from a heavenly lofty place, how could anyone once in heaven ever feel secure? How would that person know that he couldn't do what the devil had done? If the devil is a fallen angel, then maybe there'll be some more like him. And yet Revelation 21, 3 to 5, where you think Revelation 21 speaks of heaven or the church or the church in heaven, says there'll be nothing like that in the background. Otherwise, how can you have perfect peace and serenity and no anxiety? But the emphasis we're making is study each context. Don't assume and don't grasp denominational teaching to buttress something that you may believe. The devil may be a fallen angel. That's probably as good a theory as any, but I don't believe the Bible teaches that. I believe, I believe the Bible tells us we don't know where he came from. He's awesome, he's powerful, he's our enemy, and we need to war against him with the power that's in the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> if nothing else, this will help us to maybe be more alert when we study the Bible. To not take for granted things that have been passed down to us. If after you've thoroughly studied all of these passages and all the rest of the Bible, you believe and can document this concept, then you'll be a whole lot stronger anyway. But the major point that we're to discuss, as far as its beauty and power, and it ties in with what we've just uh, studied, is discussed Genesis 3.15, one of the landmark passages of the whole Bible, where God told the devil that the seed of woman would crush the devil's power. In Revelation 19.10, we read that at the end of the Bible, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And from Genesis 3.15 to Revelation 19.10, the main teaching of the Bible is Christ is coming. The Old Testament said Christ is coming. The first part of the New Testament said Christ did come. The next to last verse in the Bible says he's coming again. And from Genesis 3.15, the main character and the heart and core and beauty of the Bible centers in Christ, the seed of woman who would destroy the power of the devil. That's why it doesn't make me a difference where the devil came from. Christ is going to whip him anyway. You can destroy him, defeat him through Christ and his power at any time, anywhere, regardless of knowing where he came from. Now, here are the passages that... Back up, Genesis 3.15. 
In Isaiah 7, 14, Jehovah himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. In Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born. And among other things, he'll be prince of peace. At the birth of Jesus, angels said, peace on earth among men in whom there's goodwill. Luke 2, 14. Matthew 1, 21 to 23, tells us that the Virgin Mary, the seed of woman, the Virgin Mary gave birth to Jesus, Savior, Emmanuel, God with us, in Bethlehem of Judea, just as Micah 5, verse 2 predicted it would be. Jeremiah 31, 22, a verse seldom used, but just as powerful, says that the mediator of the new covenant would come about as a result of the following. A woman would compass a man. A woman would go around a man, bring a child into the world. The mediator of the new covenant. If you'd read Jeremiah 31, 22 carefully in the immediate context, it says that Rachel, Rachel would be weeping for her children. In Matthew chapter 2, at the birth of Jesus Christ, it's quoted again, Rachel weeping for her children. The seed of woman, uniquely, quaintly. Not the offspring of man, as in the rest of the Bible and in secular history, but the first messianic promise, the seed of woman, will destroy the power of the devil. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, Galatians 4, 4. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly, Romans 5, 6. And all of the history of the ages centered in Jesus Christ, B.C., before Christ, A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, and in the fullness of time, in due time, God sent his son, the seed of woman, to crush the devil's power. Throughout the Old and New Testament, this teaching projects itself. I believe the meaning of 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15, is centered in this very scene. She should be saved through her childbearing. I've heard that discussed and debated in many a Bible class and among many a preacher. I believe if you read from Genesis 3 through 1 Timothy 2, there's only one major emphasis in that passage. Just as woman introduced sin into the world, so she introduced the sin bearer, the sin offering, the Savior into the world. And that's how we're saved, through her childbearing, and how she will be saved through her childbearing too. It all goes back to Genesis 3.15. <coughs> In Romans 16, 20, Paul said, Satan shall be crushed under your feet shortly. 2 Corinthians 2, 14 says, we're always led in triumph in Christ. Let's go at it another way now. The seed of woman will destroy the devil's power. What had been the devil's power? Sin and death. From the time sin entered the world and death by sin in the Garden of Eden, the devil held sway, held ascendancy over mankind. Through sin, death, Hades, and hell. In Isaiah 28, we read that evil men would plot in a covenant of death, but through this stone that could not be put to naught, and those who trust in him who could not be put to flight, their covenant of death would be disannulled. Did you notice what our brother prayed a moment ago? And he and I had not spoken before that. Do you notice what he prayed concerning Jesus Christ? Proved to be the Son of God by power in his resurrection from the dead. That all ties, that Roman 1 verse 4 that he referred to in the prayer, ties to Genesis 3.15. The seed of woman was able to destroy the devil's power. Hebrews 2.14 says that Christ through death destroyed the power the devil had over death. 1 Corinthians 15.54 says, Now has come to pass the saying, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is law, but thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory over sin, death, Hades, hell, the devil, and all of his work. That's what Jesus meant in the most famous passage gospel preachers have quoted through the years. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The bars of death cannot withstand it. What did Peter say on the day of Pentecost? Acts 2, 24. He burst asunder the bands of death. All of this is tied to Genesis 3, 15, the seed of woman versus the devil and his power. 
In Mark 3, 27, Jesus said, I've entered the strong man's house and spoiled his goods. And in John 12, 31 and 33, he said, Now is the prince of this world cast out. This he spake concerning his death. Up from the grave he arose by the power of God and defeated the devil. And the most awesome power man had held sway to through the centuries. Ephesians 2, 1 begins by saying, You were dead in trespasses and sins. Later in verses 11 and 12 of Ephesians 2, you were without hope and without God in this world. Verse 16, you were unreconciled to God. But through the death of Jesus Christ, you've been bought, brought back, bound back to God. And then in Ephesians 2, 6, he says, you have been raised to sit with Christ in heavenly places. The seed of woman had destroyed the power of the devil. That's why the demons believe and tremble. James 2, 19. The seed of woman accomplished what that seed was supposed to do. The book of Romans is a powerful commentary on this. And I believe of all the things I'm saddest about in the last few years is what some brethren have done with the book of Romans. I believe that has been mutilated and abused and violated by folk who think more of Martin Luther than they do Apostle Paul. The book of Romans does not teach salvation by faith alone. It teaches salvation through the grace of God by the blood of Christ as we obey the gospel plan of salvation, the law of Jesus Christ. And here are the passages that forever say it, and yet they pay homage and tribute to the seed of woman destroying the power of the devil. Romans 3.23, and we're good about quoting one verse and leaving the next one out. Everybody knows Romans 3.23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know what the next verse says? being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 4.25 says he was delivered for our offenses, raised again for our justification. Romans 5.8 says God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we should be saved by his life. Romans 6.23 the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. At the end of Romans 7, after speaking of the tragic nature of sin and how it alienates and separates a man from God and causes men to do things they shouldn't do and not do the things they ought to do, he says in Romans seven twenty four, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. And that takes you all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Then in Romans 8, he closes by saying, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The seed of woman had destroyed the power of the devil. In Hebrews 10, 19 and 20, we read that through the veil of his flesh, Christ brings a new and living way. Now, I want to show you how these first two points dovetail together in Revelation 12. In Revelation 12, 9, the devil is called that old serpent, Satan, the devil, the deceiver of the whole world. But two verses later, we learn the way to whip him. Revelation 12, 11 says they, the saints, overcame him, the devil, through the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. And they counted not their life dear unto themselves. And that's the only way to whip the devil is through the seed of woman, through the blood of Christ, through the Redeemer. Now we come to discuss a passage that uh, wasn't as popular until about uh, 15 or 20 years ago when brethren began to awaken and how prejudiced and biased we had been all these years toward everybody except white, southwestern American, middle-class people. I didn't hear much about the Mark of Cain until about 15, 20 years ago. And people in desperation seeing the gospels going to everybody, even the people across the track and in shantytown and with different colors of skin and so forth, and people we just kind of looked over, all of a sudden we had to excuse ourselves for our lack of world evangelism. We said, well, you know, we heard all kinds of things, but one popular one was, why well, God marked those people a long time ago. You know the big problem with that, though, if you read Mark 
uh, Genesis uh, 4.15 carefully about that mark, and I saw some people doing some squirming on that, you're going to find that mark was a blessing and not a curse. So we're going to have to reverse it, and everybody was black, and the mark of Cain was he made them white. Uh, you know, we got a little problem there. Sort of like the two men talking, one white preacher and one black preacher, and the white preacher said to his black brother, don't worry, in heaven we'll all be alike. We'll all be white. <laughs> isn't, that a, isn't that a tragedy? But if you would read Genesis 4.15 carefully, you would find that the mark of Cain was a blessing. I begin reading with verse 13 of Genesis 4. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. The mark was a benevolent, beneficent occasion of God's goodness toward Cain. I'll tell you who has a bad mark on them, and that's any member of the church that's prejudiced or biased against anybody else on earth. There's the bad mark. Romans 2.11 says, God is no respecter of persons. In Acts 10, 34 and 35, Peter said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And one passage in the Bible that will forever awaken and challenge those who are uninvolved in world evangelism and the kind that begins next door or down the street or with a fellow we uh, culturally are not supposed to like is Acts 17, 24 that says, God made of one blood. All nations dwell upon the face of the earth. Jesus, by the grace of God, tasted of death for every man. Hebrews 2 9. He is the one who died for all. 2 Corinthians 5 14. And we're to preach the gospel to every creature and every nation at the end of time. And one thing that's bad wrong with a lot of people are those who speculate on things uh, in the Bible and wind up really being rebuked by their speculation. We need to understand that the mark of Cain, whatever it was, was a blessing that God placed upon him to preserve him and really to give him some comfort. Where did Cain get his wife? That was one of the first questions I was ever asked after I became a gospel preacher. The first question ever answered on a TV program. We, had, we used to have a 30-minute program out in Odessa and Midland called Bible Forum every Sunday night. And the first question I answered on that 25 years ago was where did Cain get his wife? I guess I've been asked that more than what about the thief on the cross? If I knew her first and last name and middle initial, her street address, apartment number, and telephone number, her zip code and area code, it wouldn't help save us all. The C.R. Nickel used to say, uh, why, silly, Cain got his wife at his father-in-law's house. And I guess that's a good, <laughs> good answer as any. One man asked a preacher where would Cain get his wife, and he said it's not proper to go through life worrying about another man's wife. <laughs> really, those answers are better sometimes than the question. But if you listened real carefully a moment ago as we read Genesis 4, 13 through 17, Cain was aware that there were a lot of people on earth. He said, I'm afraid that everywhere I go, they'll try to kill me. He knew that there were a lot of people in the world at that time. Where did Cain get his wife? One thing I learned from this is that the Bible does not cater to human curiosity. What did Jesus write in the sand? What kind of wood was the wood of the cross that Jesus died on? What kind of bush was on fire when God spoke to Moses? Why did the angel sit on the foot of the tomb when Jesus rose from the dead? All of those questions put together would really be better asking, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be pleasing unto the Lord? The purpose of Scripture is not to tell us where Cain got his wife, but to tell us Christ is coming. From uh, the seed of woman, from the family of Abraham, Genesis 22, 18, from the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49, 10, on those points, God couldn't be more specific. He was willing to say 
something unique. The Savior will be born of a virgin. He will come from the family of Abraham, seed of Abraham, from the tribe of Judah. But when it comes to these matters that have nothing to do with our redemption, the Bible is just not engaging in a full discussion. The secret things belong to God. The things that are revealed belong to man. Deuteronomy 29, 29. And all things that pertain to life and godliness have been revealed. 2 Peter 1, 3. And all that we need to make us complete is revealed in the Holy Scriptures. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. But it is true, though the Bible is not a compendium of every fact, place, or incident, doesn't answer every question that we would like answered, <laughs> we do learn that he had a son, he and his wife had a son, son named Enoch, in this same context, verse 17 of chapter 4. We also learn in Genesis chapter 21 that Abraham was married to his sister. This was before the Levitical code concerning marriages to relatives had been given. So Cain could have gotten his wife in a number of places. And he was aware there were other people in the world at that time. I do not believe the Bible tells us everything about the uh, genealogy lists of the dating and that nature. That's just not his purpose. But we know enough for what we need to know to please God in this life and go to heaven. The last question, <laughs> why did people before the flood live so long? The main reason is they had more birthdays. But uh, <laughs> they give these questions to the deepest scholar among us. You can tell that. <clears throat> we learn from the Bible, the book of Genesis, that Methuselah lived 969 years. We learn that Joshua lived just 110 years. In the New Testament, we learn that Jesus lived only one-third of a century. And one thing I learned from all that is there's not how long you live that counts, but how well you live that counts. <clears throat> Why did they live longer? Many people have suggested that God's plan in the beginning, by its very nature, required longevity for his plan to, quote, get off the ground, unquote. And once those things were set in motion, the purpose of long life was no longer served. Others have said there's a great indication from Genesis 6, 3, that their lives were shortened because of their sin. My spirit shall not always strive with man, he said. And it is true that after the flood, the age span is not nearly so long. Others have suggested, and with a lot of merit, that after the flood, the perfect climate and the atmosphere that had existed prior to the flood and prior to God uh, being so grieved over the sinless of man no longer existed and that it wasn't possible for people to live as long because the elements and the climate and the atmosphere was different. Some have suggested that as a reminder of what sin does, sin separates a man from God, Isaiah 59, and as an example of what Exodus 20 and Ephesians 6 means, that your life may be long upon the earth if you obey and honor your parents. Just as those people on earth had quit honoring their heavenly parents, their lives were no longer long upon the earth. Others, such as Charles Pfeiffer, who is a great Old Testament scholar, particularly in the book of Genesis, uh, probably has done some of the greatest work that has been done in the last uh, 50 years, has cited the fact that calendars were different and time was reckoned differently, that years uh, did not mean the same, citing as does C.C. C. Crawford in the uh, reprint uh, Restoration uh, Library and others. Four kings in the Sumerian a kingdom that ruled 50,000 years, in other words, over 12,000 years apiece, the way they counted time. Another cited one man who is quoted as ruling 43,200 years. When I read all those things, uh, none of which I could document or prove, I'm reminded of Psalm 90, verse 10, that says the most we can really expect is 80 years. And two verses later, we read, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. I'm reminded of Ephesians 5, 16, buy up the time because the days are evil. 
in 2 Samuel 14, 14, for we must all needs die, and our water spilt upon the ground that can never be gathered again. The emphasis of the Bible is for us to not boast ourselves of tomorrow, for we know not what the day will bring forth, Proverbs 27, 1. And while this may be interesting, the practical side of this is that as long as we do live, we glorify God. We shouldn't be perplexed if we can't answer all of those questions because there's a lot greater question, and that is how do I spend every day that I have upon the earth in the sight of God and man? The poet said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. There's so many great teachings in the Bible that remind us of our relationship to God. I have a few other points in the book that are of a more scholarly nature, so you know how smart I was. But I got all that from somebody else, and I don't know if it's true anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Isaac said, I know not the day of my death, Genesis 27, 2. Isaiah said, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near, Isaiah 55. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, Luke 19, 10, and we're to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. 2 Peter 3.18, if we do all that in the day of judgment, we still may not can answer some of these questions, but we can answer the great one, is my name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I believe the greatest book ever written in the field of homiletics is the Lord's Word. And in the book of Acts chapter 2, we have a model of preaching. And among other things, so characteristic of that sermon was the fact that Peter called to the attention of the people assembled on that day what the Lord had said. Quoted Psalms chapter 16, Joel chapter 2. And one of the great marks of Johnny's presentation today and always is when you hear him is a constant reference to what saith the Lord. And we're very thankful for this presentation today and for the help that Brother Ramsey has given to us in the study of the past hour. I'm Jeff Archie for the International Gospel. Music recognition. Selected. Screen.